Hi. Okay. We're live. We're live. Yes. Calling Chris Anderson in London, England. Still in London, England, and calling Rick Fire in Chicago. Chicago, it's I'm here. Like two weeks in a row, we're so, where we're supposed to be. I know. Welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours in Europe, the U.S., and the Pacific, and you can check them all out at stephenambrosetours.com. And Chris, whether people are watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast, podcast thank you for joining us. And today we're going to be talking about the year 1932. And we hope you all got in okay. We, we, uh, we put up a link on Facebook, which is the YouTube link, and we hope everybody got in. But of course, if you didn't get in, you're not hearing this. So I don't <laughs> expect any complaints from the people who are here. Uh, Chris, we should thank everybody who supports us on Patreon, and most especially our top shelf sponsors. Absolutely. Patrons. Patrons. They're not sponsors. Um, and you can join this group by clicking on www.patreon.com slash history happy hour. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that would be awesome. Uh, and I wanted to let people know um, that, Chris, that I, thanks to a recommendation from uh -huh. you, uh, mm -hmm. I am going to be speaking next week uh, at a world, or not next week, excuse me, in January oh. at a World War II conference in um, um, uh, Florida. Where uh, in Florida, Rick? Pardon, it's going to be in central Florida. I think it's going to be in Zephyr Hills, Florida. That's what you told me, yes. Just outside of Tampa. Uh, oh. And it is. Um, here, I'll put up a link Let's there so that you can see that. And, so if you want to see Rick in person, yes, he'll uh, sign your History Happy Hour hat. Exactly. And yeah. actually, so this came about because of a recommendation from Chris uh, uh, and uh, and to his friend uh, Jay Wirtz. And the conference is called A New Look at World War II. So it's new because it's in 2024. Um <laughs> How American Technology and Diversification Helped Win World War II in 1944 and Started the New American Military. And Chris, do you, can you guess, can you guess what you think I might be talking about at this conference? Mm. Oh, I mean, here, here's their oh, website, oh. by the way. This is what it looks like. How, how, how quickly do I have to answer that question? Uh, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Uh, uh, well, uh, since you talk about them all the time, all the time, constantly, constantly, constantly. The Ghost Army? The Ghost Army. Oh, there you go. The Ghost Take Army. So if you're interested in hearing about the Ghost Army, I'm doing one other talk as well. If What's that one about? Coming to warm Florida in January. Also, Alex Kershaw will be there, famous World Good. War II author. Mm -hmm. um, Helen Patton, our friend Helen oh, Patton, will be yeah. there. And um, uh, they're going to have a bunch of World War II veterans there, too, which should be really? interesting. Oh, well, that's kind of so, cool. Yeah, so uh, it's this is their website. And, yeah, check it out. Um, and please, if you feel inclined to, join me there. Okay, I think I've given that enough. I think so. I think enough at this okay. point. Yeah. So, Chris, uh, I think we're ready to go. Why don't you give me a cue here and we can get started. <laughs> The bar and the banner. Bar is open and the banner is still there. So yeah. I'm going to have to take the banner down so that uh, we can keep it. There going. we go. There All right. Now the bar is open. Uh, 1932 is a pivotal year in American history, and it's best known as the election year in which the governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, defeated the incumbent president of the United States, Herbert Hoover. Uh, and that launched the New Deal, uh, 12 years of Roosevelt as president, and a massive change in the role of the U.S. government. But that election is really just one of many things going on in 1932 uh, in a tumultuous year. And our guest today, Scott Martell, has written a book trying to capture the whole story of that year. And it's called, Chris, you'll never guess the title. The Ghost Army. Oh, 1932. <laughs> Uh, FDR Hoover and the Dawn of a New America. And Scott is a third generation journalist who spent seven years on the editorial board of the Los Angeles Times. And this is his seventh book, which just came out on Tuesday. And so we want to welcome to the show Scott Martell. Scott, thank you so much for welcome. joining us. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Oh, wow. Pleasure. And, and did, you, did you get the instructions about having a cocktail? 
All right. See. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Uh, it's okay. an IPA from a local brewery called Three Heads, which is conveniently located about seven tenths of a mile from my house. Does that have, did that determine where you purchased your house, or did you discover that later? That was lucky happenstance. It was actually one of three brew pubs within walking distance, and wow. that bought the house. Damn. And we moved here in April after 26 years in Irvine, California, where you had to drive everywhere. Yeah. So this is our welcome. Yeah. And you're in Rochester, wow. New York, right? Yeah, Rochester, New York. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. So we, 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 why you moved from California to Rochester is a question almost as good as the one you asked me when I said I'm coming to Rochester in January, and you said why. So there you go. Um, we all have our reasons. Scott, 1932. Uh, um, um, what led you to this topic? It's a it's a big year, obviously, very famous presidential election. A lot of books have been written about it. So what drew you in and made you want to kind of tackle this topic and thought there was kind of room for another book about 1932? I've been interested in that era of American history for a long time, uh, especially the radical elements of it. I've always found that kind of intriguing. <clears throat> As you mentioned, there's been a slew of books written about the election and the Great Depression and all that. But what I was trying to do was find a way to delve into um, what life was like for you know, most Americans at that time without you know, sort of downplaying the importance of the election itself. Um, so I, I decided to use the election as a narrative backbone. Everybody knows how that story turns out. And use that to open up doors and all these other things that were going on in the country at the same time, including you know, like the, the, the push for repeal of prohibition, which was hugely influential in that election. Um, there was unrest in the streets. Uh, communist groups were trying to organize some of these these uh, strikes and walkouts and stuff. So it was just fascinating to me. Yeah. So I was going to. That was you, you kind of led into, or, or you know, uh, my first question, or part of it was. So what's the state of the nation on December thirty first before this year begins? I mean, what are some of some of the big issues that that America is dealing with and facing? I know a lot of them are are man made, but there's some natural issues. Um, and there are, are there some in particular you think that people have sort of forgotten about or that were important then that aren't looked at? Yeah, I, I think we talk so much about how bad the depths of the Great Depression were that we sort of lose track of what the impact was on individual families and lives. And so at the turn of the year, at the beginning of that, um, the, the Depression hadn't quite bottomed out yet, but it was still pretty awful. Uh, there were no, there were actually no uh, safety net programs back then. It was mostly you know, local support stuff, local cities, local organizations, and that was not even close to sufficient to, to handle the, the problems. Um, there was political turmoil. Um, uh, the Republican Party itself was kind of a disarray. Hoover was their standard bearer, but most of the upper echelon of the party didn't really like him. Um, the, the, the only office he ever ran for was president, and he won. And he didn't really have, he wasn't part of the, the in crowd, you know, of the upper echelon yeah. of the party. Um, and he didn't like retail politics. He didn't like the kind of coalition building you need to do, the horse training you need to do. Um, he was hugely um, confident in his own ability to understand problems and problem solve. And couldn't understand what people would get in his way politically. So you have that, that was sort of the tone of the, of the national government, the federal government. Um, and meanwhile, everything was falling apart from the ground all across the country. You know, farmers, yeah. you know, couldn't make any money. The the costs are getting, uh, prices are getting paid for their food, their product was below the cost. They're running to bankruptcy. Banks were foreclosing, uh, shutting down, being uh, closed up. So it was just just utter turmoil. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, Herbert Hoover uh, is is the president, and one of the things I've always been blown away by is that, that this guy, he's an engineer, uh, and he became famous organizing relief for people uh, in Europe, uh, both uh, during and after World War I. Uh, and he was the can-do guy, the Mr. Get-It-Done guy. So you would think that this guy would be the perfect person to have in the White House when the bottom drops out of the economy and people are in trouble because he's dealt with that before. So why is he so undone by the, the Depression? I think it had most to do with his sense of the role of the federal government. You know, he was inflexible on that. This, you know, these, these social welfare problems are things that are best solved in local community, maybe at the state level. They weren't things that the federal taxpayer should be on the hook for. And he just stuck to that 
uh, even when it was clear that obviously they needed to do something bigger and better and broader and more bold than, than what he was going to go along with. So just that sort of disconnect of that strict adherence to economic theory and, and political theory in the face of evidence that that really wasn't working out the way it needed to. So, but uh, I mean, I want to expand on that a bit because again, I think we sort of caricaturize uh, Hoover now because of the depression, but before that, um, I have a quote here for, in the book that Will Rogers says, when we as individuals get sick or hurt, we send for doctor. But when the whole states get sick, we, set, we send for Hoover. He's America's family physician. He's a great guy, is Doc Hoover, and I hope they don't spoil him by putting him into politics. Yeah. So there was a much different perception of him <laughs> before this. So, I mean, again, for people who aren't aware, tell us a little bit more about where he stood in the American public opinion and how he got there. He was, he was a national hero. I mean, you mentioned he first, he was a self-made man, self-made millionaire, uh, orphaned, uh, Quaker, uh, orphaned in Iowa, went to Oregon, was raised by an uncle in Oregon. Um, got into, he was one of the first uh, entries to Stanford University. Uh, left there, went to mining, was in China for a while, uh, uh, made a, a boatload of money, uh, wound up in London, and he was in London World War One began. And he decided at that point it was time to do something non you know, self rewarding. He wanted to get into public service. And he wound up setting up this organization for relief for, for Belgians. Um, Belgium was controlled by the Germans. The British had blockaded it because they were afraid of any food that would get into Belgium would just go get powered away to Germany. And he, just through sheer force of will and argument, um, created this organization, got pledges of money, um, pledges of food. Uh, argued with the Germans that they got them to promise that they wouldn't take the food, and based on that promise, the Brits suddenly came and let the ships get through to, to Belgium, and, and he saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Belgians from starvation. The U.S. gets into the war; he can't do that job anymore because now he's aligned with the combatant. He comes home, and uh, President Wilson puts him in charge of the food supply in the U.S., kind of doing the same thing for the U.S. as he moved to 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 well, war footing. And by all accounts, he was eminently successful at this. I mean, as, as right. Rick mentioned, he was, he was a, a, the go-to guy for getting this kind of stuff done. Right. Um, and you know, he was very good at, <clears throat> at cultivating media attention. He was good at talking to reporters, uh, primarily because all he was really talking about were good deeds, you know, things. Yeah. He didn't get a lot of criticism that year. He was notoriously yeah. thin-skinned and that got worse as, as time went on. But at that time, he was a hero sort of basking in the glow of the American media. And you will know, Rogers comment on that. It's like, he's, he's the guy to call when the country is sick. Yeah. And Rick, can I just ask, ask one more question? I mean, you can I, ask I've always as been, many more as you want. Chris. I've always been curious about this. Here's a guy who sort of gains his fame and notoriety through dealing with and working with governments. And then he works in the government. Yeah. Yet he has a particularly limited view of the role of government. And does he ever... Were you any comments on that at all, or like how he sees that? Because yeah. he may have, he wrote voluminous biographies yeah. and memoirs. I didn't read them all. Uh, right. I'm focusing just on 32, so I was trying. Yeah, to obviously, to obviously I don't want to like drag it too yeah, far. Yeah, I mean, in the book, if I go went down those rabbit holes, yeah. Um, what he looked, what he believed in was a government uh, private sector partnership. He saw the federal government's role in getting the different actors together, you know, labor and corporations and, and what have you, and getting them to work together toward a solution, not necessarily having the federal government impose a solution or find a solution. And that, that was the difference. So. Well, it's, you know, there's a comment from one of our viewers here, and I'm not uh, just I think it's worth putting up here. David Picker says, my late father, who immigrated from Poland in 1929 and was a lifelong liberal New Deal Democrat, once shut me down when I criticized Herbert Hoover. He told me that man fed me. So that does give you an idea of kind of the way he was regarded. Now, his opponent in this presidential election race, and there are some other people involved in the periphery, but they're not really terribly important. His opponent in this race is going to be Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And <clears throat> Hoover and Roosevelt know each other, and you, you describe them as being sort of between being business acquaintances and being friends. Uh, but Hoover doesn't have a very uh, uh, doesn't have a very high respect for his opponent. So tell us a little bit about Franklin Roosevelt and why why Hoover kind of uh, uh, looked down on him a little bit. Well, it's, it's interesting because Hoover thought FDR was a political lightweight. 
And remember, Hoover wasn't very good at politician. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, so it was a lightweight criticizing a heavyweight for being a lightweight. It was kind of bizarre. <laughs> yeah. um, Roosevelt loved retail politics. Um, as governor during the Depression, he tried a bunch of different programs, uh, unemployment programs, that kind of stuff, just different things to try to, to get money to people, support to people. He wasn't uh, a supporter of public dole programs at the time, um, but he was he was much more interested in, in using the, the power of government, the size of government to help people. And as the campaign was going on, he was brutally uh, and viciously uh, condemnatory of Hoover and the Republicans for not doing enough, which is you know, political grandstanding in a sense, because Hoover did try a few things, just it, none of it was really enough to, to, to do anything. Um, but FDR was really good at the retail politics. And his whole approach was he, he wasn't selling policy. He didn't really have any policy suggestions when he got the nomination. He was sort of selling himself as a solution to the problem. You know, a guy who will, who will bring in all the experts and figure out what caused this and what we can do to, to, to make it better. So he was selling optimism and faith. And remember, at the time, everybody pretty much believed whoever the Democrats uh, nominated was going to beat Hoover. Hoover's in such bad shape. So his his challenge as a candidate was to not screw it up, right? Not not, not say something and do something that would give people pause to, to leave or to go back to support Hoover. So, so one of the things, you know, I, I kind of like to get your thoughts on is speaking about Roosevelt and comparing him to Hoover. Uh, and you mentioned this in the book, but here's Roosevelt, who is um, from the upper reaches of American society, if you will, is a bit of a patrician. Uh, but he's viewed as the man of the people. And Hoover is the self-made man. Uh, but he's not. And I mean, that, that Kind of strikes me as interesting, and I, I know you talk about it somewhat in the book with um, you know Roosevelt going on a on a yachting expedition at the start of his campaign. Yeah. Is anybody at the time in 1932 saying this seems a little odd, or is this, or or, or by that point, had Hoover dug himself so deep he couldn't get out? Uh, a little bit of, of both. I mean, there was sort of like, who is this guy? Who says he's you know the man of the people kind of thing. Oh. Um, but if you heard him on the radio, Hoover stunk at mass media. He, he stunk at the radio. I mean, he was just awful on that stuff. Uh, hated the retail politicking. At first, he didn't even want to go out on the campaign trail when he was running for re-election because he thought it was beneath the dignity of the office to engage in such behavior. Um, Hoover loved, or Roosevelt loved people. He loved getting out on the, on the trail. Some of his advisors suggested that he not take some of these whistle stop train tours because they're afraid he was going to say something and, and screw up the campaign. But he just loved meeting with people. He just sort of seemed to, to gain energy you know, by being out among folks. And that's contagious. And when you're on, when the people who are listening to the radio um, are in abject poverty, depression, personal depression, economic depression, no sense of hope. And here's this guy with a warm, uplifting voice, essentially a father figure, a grandfather figure saying, you know, we're going to get through this. It's going to be okay. We're, we're going to get through this. You know, we'll, we'll make it work. You know, well, this is kind of what you to fear is fear itself, which you know came later. But it was that kind of attitude that I think made people say, okay, Hoover isn't the guy. Let's, let's go with FDR. And you can't underestimate the power of the last name. The country still loved Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. And yeah, so so he had a you know, sort of a built in you know tailwind with that. Right, right. We promise we won't stay on the presidential election for the entire conversation, but uh, we all know turn that so another <laughs> And, and if you don't know, you know, we won't well, say. you're probably watching the wrong show then. <laughs> well, if you don't know, it's in the second to last chapter. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can buy the book. You can wait for it to come or you can Google it. Um, but anyway, we have another question from a, a viewer, uh, Wally Morrison. Why was Hoover not liked by the Republican establishment? I mean, here he is. He's this can do guy. He's I mean, yes, he's bad at retail politicking, but he's got a lot of positive traits. Why isn't he more warmly embraced by the Republican establishment? I'm sort of a harbinger of, of current politics. Um, he had served in a Democratic administration and he had uh, written a letter. I forget the timing to whom it was, but it was urging people to stick with the Democrats in Congress during the war to avoid changing horses in the middle of the stream. And when you're a, a party person, that's like treason, you know. And so the top echelon never trusted him because of that. You know, they weren't sure really where he stood. And I remember in 1920, I wrote about this in the book a little bit, uh, most people didn't know whether he was a Democrat or Republican. And, and FDR, among other people, tried to get him to run for the presidency as a Democrat. And that, that's how 
amorphous he was. People didn't really know what he stood for. And then he declares he's a Republican, and suddenly he's the state of of the party. So the whole structure just, just never warmed up to him. And like I mentioned before, he didn't do the horse trading kind of stuff. Um, he, just, he just didn't like the politics of it. He wasn't a compromiser. Chris, if I can just jump in. No, the, please do. The, you know, it, it's interesting that, that he's a person that people don't really even know if he's a Democrat or a Republican. And you, uh, you know, you contrast that with today where, I mean, I don't think there's a public figure that we would say, well, wait a minute, is he, is he on, you know, which side is he on? Um, but all through the um, 30s, 40s, 50s, and even into the 60s, there were, there were people who were businessmen, who were experts, who were kind of, uh, you know, public policy folks who, who sort of seemed to survive in Republican administrations and Democratic administrations. There seemed to be much more crossover during those times that, that seems to have really stopped in the, in the 70s and 80s, 90s and beyond. Don't yeah. you think? Yeah, my personal, well, now it's not, we, have, we know who's Democrat, who's Republican. The argument is, what kind of Democrat are you? What kind of Republican are you? So that, that two-way thing is now, you know, 8, 10, 12. Um, now, I forgot what your, what your question was, sorry. Yeah, I ha hardly asked a question. <laughs> I was, I was, you mostly, that. yeah, I was mostly just, just sort of saying, uh, it's just striking how different but, it was. Yeah, and, and that's primarily because um, the political elite back then was wealthy, whether Republican or Democrat. You know, the guy who bankrolled the Democratic Party, John Jacob Raskob, was um, a, a top aide to DuPont and was one of the investors and leaders of General Motors. And he's a Democratic financier. So we had a little, we had a little bit of that in the modern era in the Clinton administration, where it was just sort of the Wall Street money and the rich guys were, were the ones who were, who were the power brokers in both parties. Um, I think maybe that's why there was so much back and forth, because there really wasn't that much difference as a Democrat banker or a Republican banker. So, so Scott, what are the, I mean, just to kind of get away a little bit from the election, I'm sure we'll get back to it, but what are some of the other <clears throat> things that are going on in that year that are kind of bubbling to the surface would be one thing, obviously, and not the depression, obviously, writ large is there, but um, are there other kind of topics or issues that come up that, you know, are, are events or issues in their own right that we should know about that? Yeah, the big one is another event that we sort of know about, but, but most people don't recognize how significant it was in the, the 32 election, and that's the move to repeal prohibition. Right. Um, was, I write about this in the book. There was a, this was pre-public polling. There was a marketing guy who was doing his polling uh, customers and different uh, retailers. And he did a poll for the Hoover White House, asking several questions, you know, sending people to talk face to face with voters, asking a slew of questions on the intro ball now. The ones that were most salient is he talked to Republicans. They talked to Republicans who had decided they were, who had voted for Hoover in 28 and decided they were going to vote for FDR in 32. And they're asking them why. And it turned out most of these folks actually thought the economy was in, in a good track and was moving forward and worse of the depression was behind the country. What really uh, pushed them away was the prohibition issue. Uh, Hoover and Republicans wanted to stick with it and FDR and the Democrats, FDR kind of dragging his heels. And the Democrats were fully on board with uh, the full repeal of prohibition. And that seems to have been one of the things that, that was really, one of the, the, the subcurrents that was really driving the politics in that era. So and that's so that's an example of you know people at the time had issues that they were focused on that we don't even think about or right. or, or, or give enough weight to because I mean I know you had uh, what Pauline Sabin saying prohibition has divided the United States like Gaul into three parts right. wet dry and hypocrites yeah I love that quote, I love that quote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well you know it, it, there's a, a another quote from your book uh, and this is really from you as the writer. You say the odds of repealing the 18th Amendment, which was the amendment that created prohibition, were so long because the politics were so difficult, few people, even those actively seeking it, thought repeal possible. Now, I would have thought after 12 years of prohibition, with the, with the country being dry, with the rise of organized crime, that, that, um, that repeal would be easy. Uh, that that would be uh, easy to come to. So what makes it difficult? And, and the candidates don't just just to be clear, the candidates aren't like ones for and ones against. They're all kind of rah, 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 on the fence there. So talk to us about about the what made it difficult and what the position of the candidates were. Yeah, Hoover was supporting prohibition, but it didn't really he didn't really care about it. 
Um, FDR was against prohibition, but he didn't want to talk about it because he thought the selection would be one on economics, and he just didn't want to de deal with that issue, in large part because Southern Democrats supported prohibition, and he didn't want to run the risk of alienating them during the election. Um, but then the party sort of moved beyond him, and, and, and he, was, he was stuck with that. Um, I forgot where I was going with this, sorry. Well, well, the other part <laughs> of that question was was simply why why was it difficult? Why was this an issue that people thought they weren't going to win? Why why was repeal a difficult yeah. issue? Yeah, this really gets into the weeds. But um, prohibition was uh, adopted through votes by state legislatures, and in conservative states, dry states, you know that's a power broker thing. It's not a it's not a, a plebiscite. So, you know, nobody's voting on this except for the, the elected folks. Um, and what Saban and the other repeal folks are trying to do, we're trying to push uh, a, a national amendment, federal amendment, um, that would require state conventions to approve this. And nobody thought they'd be able to get that through. I mean, it was just sort of that was the bridge too far, you know, because nobody wants, nobody at any state level wants to give up power on a big decision like that. And contrary to their expectations, that, that managed to mothball and, and or, 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 that managed to snowball. And get through. So, so one of the things that um, I think is really effective in your book is in between chapters and sections, you have sort of diary entries uh, of people living through those times. Um, and also, you talk about what's called newsreels. Um, so, I think it's, it's easy when uh, you're reading these history books very often, you kind of get swept up in these higher level esoteric conversations and you forget that it's, it's sort of ordinary folks that are living through these things. So, um, well, two parts. One is I was wondering if there was anything that you kind of, and inserting that stuff into the book that surprised you about what people then were thinking or saying. And also, um, as the depression is getting worse and worse, how are ordinary people reacting to this? What sort of things are they doing to, to, to kind of deal with this incredibly difficult situation? Since, as you say, you know, the government's kind of hands off. Yeah, right. Um, I didn't do, I'm a journalist, not a historian, so I didn't do a broad, <clears throat> you know, collect material and do a statistical analysis of where people's views were. Right. I sort of grabbed them as illustrative more than right. you know, setting out, you know, firm data. Sure, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> me. Um, what I wanted to do, the whole point of the book, as we talked about earlier, is to try to recreate that era. And I realized if I told too many of these stories, I'd take the reader down too many cul-de-sacs. Yep. I thought they were important things to weave in. So the newsreel gave me a chance to touch on other issues like the kidnapping of Lindbergh, maybe, yep. which is important in that year, not important necessarily, not a high level of importance, importance to the, the stuff I'm writing about. Right. And the diary entries gave me a chance to have individual Americans in their own voice talk with their lives at the time. And interestingly to me, it was hard to find entries that were about politics. Yeah. Think about, you know, people's diaries are writing about, you know, Cousin Linda came this week and we went to Grandma's for dinner and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but so I found some that did interview some political observations in it. And so I was able to sort of you know, stack those together in a uh, chronological order from different places around the country and from people of different walks of life. It was the governor's wife from uh, South Carolina, I think it was. Um, a black janitor in Fort Wayne, Indiana, who's also a landlord. Um, a woman in California, in Swift County, California, Arizona, Rocky Marriage, she's writing about that. I was also rocking about, uh, writing about what's happening in their communities. Um, the guy in Fort Wayne uh, was trying to get a loan to buy more property, no banks are giving loans, you know, so he mentions that. Uh, a woman in Utah married to a doctor uh, talks about all the family stuff I was mentioning. And, and Junior and somebody went to a movie today and the doctor came home to first her husband was a doctor. Um, so his business is worse than it's ever been. He's not sure how he's going to be able to pay the bills. He's got a tax bill coming up. He's not going to be able to pay that. So you see how the financial stress of the Depression is really inserting itself into the lives of these people as they're going on with their, their everyday lives. And I thought that was an interesting way of sort of broadening yeah. the impact of this without having to do a chapter on the guy in the Yeah, me. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things reading the the diary entries and reading the newsreel items that I that I felt I came away with is one, there's a, a whole lot of stuff happened during that year, right? I mean, it's just a it just seems like a nonstop news ticker of events that like oh that was in 1932, like you mentioned the Lindbergh baby kidnapping, and two 
it, I mean, at least as I viewed what you put, and as you said, it's not a scientific, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, set of set of excerpts, but uh, that people didn't really grasp that they were living through this pivotal year in American history. Yeah, when you're in the middle of a pivot, do you really know it's pivotal? Right. Yeah. Well, listen, and, and, and without without with, without um, you know going dangerously near the sun here, I think we're in a, <laughs> we're in a we're in a year right now that that might be a pivotal year, and I think a lot of people do know they do have a right. sense of it. Well, they fear it. Yeah. 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 So, so Scott, one of the things you know, we had mentioned this, or you had mentioned this um, before the show, that you know you, that drew you to the subject that interested you, and, and I found really interesting were some of these other sort of fringe movements and and um, organizations that are either coming out of this situation or swirling around there. So, um, you know, just maybe talk about some of those. I know there's the, there's the jobless party. There's um, things like that. Where do they come from and what are they, what are they trying to do and, and where do they sit in all this? Yeah, <clears throat> I didn't write this in the book and I kick myself for not drawing this at the time, but you have the jobless party, which is run by uh, Father James Cox, um, the Pittsburgh priest. Uh, who was at heart kind of a populist, and he didn't think the Democrats or Republicans were either of them were doing anything for the hungry people he was trying to feed in Pittsburgh. And the Communist Party had arranged uh, some hunger marches on Washington, and it irked him, it galled him that communists who he despised um, were, were leading this cause as he perceived it. He thought that you know, that should be a role for, for a true American, a patriot. And so he sort of inserted himself into it and began this movement. But he was kind of a kind of a populist leader. And you have the World War I vets. Um, Congress said after World War I had approved a bonus to be paid to World War I vets. Uh, when you're in the Army, you didn't benefit from the increase in wages that private sector folks did during the war. And this bill was a way to try to make them whole. But to pass it politically, they, had, they made it uh, payable in 1945. <laughs> so for the vets who are starving in 1932, I say WTF, a guy named uh, Waters in uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, started making a pitch out there to have a march on Washington. Everyone says marching on Washington, we may as well too. And that's a big part of the storyline of the book is the bonus army and the bonus march. Um, but he winds up being kind of a populist leader. He's got his own little group of people, the blue shirts. So there are these, these fringe organizations rallying around specific causes. And these guys get a little taste of power. And it, it starts to become you know, something different at that point. So that, that struck me as really fascinating, and probably worth another book by somebody else. But it's, but it's a fascinating scenario. <laughs> well, t let's talk about the bonus march a little bit. Um, this is a, a, a very big event in 1932, in which thousands, 20,000 or more uh, veterans travel to Washington to demand that the government pay their World War I bonus. Uh, and this becomes one of the big things in the year, and there's going to be a big confrontation between uh, the Army, led by Douglas MacArthur, uh, and the uh, World War I vets. But it gets off to a pretty inauspicious start. I was fascinated reading your book about kind of the, you know, the people who start this in Portland, Oregon. They have no idea what it's going to become. No, no. And they didn't even get news coverage until they were a third of the way across the country. So it's just another another band of hobos hopping traders, you know, heading. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, they began in Oregon. Um, uh, William Waters, I'm sorry, Walter Waters, um, was meeting, speaking at meetings of veterans in Oregon. And like I said, they decided they should have their own march in Washington and make their own demands. And I think there's a couple hundred of them uh, wound up leaving Portland and they're hopping traders. And they're getting a little bit of help from vets who work for the railroads who you know, look the other way while these guys hopped in freight cars and moved along. But then the, the freight companies, the rail companies, realize what was happening. And they began sending uh, rail police to confront them. And that's when the sort of gets into the media. You know, newspaper reporters begin picking up on, on what's going on. And as accounts show up in newspapers, other vets in other parts of the country began saying, well, we should go to Washington too. So there are groups leaving from like Chicago, from Cleveland, uh, New Orleans, you know, from all over the country. These guys are getting together and hopping on the, on the freight trains and moving toward Washington. And in fact, uh, several thousand, I don't know what the number is, I don't think anybody ever counted, the several thousand veterans were already in D.C. before the Oregon contingent got there because they started from a closer uh, vantage point. So, so just fascinating. It's like the sort of this, you know, Waters and these other guys have this idea and suddenly at any given time, rich in 20,000, at any given time, there are 20,000 vets in Washington, much more than that 
would cycle them out. So they'd go for, for a few days or a few weeks and then go home. So just this massive outpouring uh, by veterans. And well, what's the reaction to, oh, sorry, Rick. Go, go ahead, Chris. Uh, so what's the reaction of the American people to, to these marchers? Um, it seems to be, well, yeah, there's no polling back then. Yeah, right. and letters and stuff. It seems to be um, somewhat supportive. Uh, there was a legitimate debate over whether, because they're veterans, they deserve money that when other people are starving. Um, I think that's kind of a, and you see that argument today about people who need uh, general assistance. Right? Well, why should we help them? You know, my kid needs shoes. So right. you, see, you know, have that kind of, you know, you know sort of kicking down the, the people who really need something, you know. Um, but when we got to Washington initially, uh, so, so there's, you know, political Washington, who were in the rest of the, the power structure, who were uncertain, were cognizant of the blowback if they were to do anything to intervene, Hoover recognized that they had a First Amendment right to petition the government. Um, they don't think they realized that how big this thing was going to get. Uh, people in Washington were finding kind of curious. Uh, they'd come down and you know, look at the, the guys in the shanties. And some would bring food, some would bring support. Um, but there was a, a vote by the Senate that essentially squashed any chance of them getting paid as the bonus uh, at that point. And once that happened, Washington official and uh, residential Washington turned on them. Well, that's okay. okay you, made, you made your point. You had your say. Now get out of Washington. Go home. And thousands have been refused to. And that led to a huge showdown. They had a camp encampment in the Anacostia Flats, uh, which is across the river of southeast Washington. And that eluded uh, MacArthur was the head of the, the military in Washington. And Hoover decided it was time to for the, the veterans who were camped out along Pennsylvania Avenue, where the Federal Triangle is now, was a bunch of federally owned buildings. And a lot of these guys had squatted in those buildings. Treasury Department supposedly needed to get uh, moving on demolition so they could build uh, the Federal Triangle. And that was the pretense for sending in the, the feds argued that the local police had lost control of the the veterans, which wasn't the case apparently. Um, but uh, Hoover told the, the military to, to oust these guys from those those buildings, uh, which they did uh, quite brutally and quite efficiently. And he didn't give them an order to cross the bridge into Anacostia, but MacArthur saw these guys as a communist organization, and he was intending to rouse them all from, from the district. So in defiance of orders from Hoover, he crossed the bridge anyway, and the you know, went through the, the Anacostia camp. And there was arsons on both sides by the time they were done. They, pretty much everything was burned to the ground. Can you imagine Douglas MacArthur disobeying orders? From Never. No, I'm shocked. Shocked. <laughs> that, well, well, the fun part is one of his top assistants was Eisenhower. You've got to no. hope you his eyes at some point. Yeah. And Eisenhower <laughs> was desperately trying to hide, and, and Douglas MacArthur is, puts on his full dress uniform, and he's going to lead these troops. He's, this right. is going to be his mo He's chief of staff of the U.S. Army. Yeah. He's going to lead these guys out there, and uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty crazy day. You know, look, there are numerous protest movements going on in 1932. The bonus marchers may be the biggest, but they're not the only one. You've got farmers in Iowa and elsewhere who are withholding their goods from market unless prices are raised. You've got people organizing, you know, just to survive, just to find some way to get food. And one might expect that with so much suffering and people becoming radicalized by the conditions that the very idea of capitalism would be under threat. And yet it doesn't really seem like that was ever near to happening. You know, what's what's your take? Why 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 didn't this lead to a kind of a more broad revolution against the system that we operate under? I think at heart Americans then and now perceive uh, radical thought as anti-American and contrary to being an American. Um, I'm having to hold that view, but I think that's a, a prevalent view. Um, there were a lot of folks, I mentioned this in the book, there were a lot of folks who were happy to be organized by communists and left-wing folks because um, they were hungry, they needed a job, they needed food. And once they got a job, you know, they kind of drifted away. So it's like, you know, yeah, well, we'll take your help because we're fighting for a common cause at this point, which happens to be my benefit, um, save my life, save my family. And then they sort of moved beyond that. Um, the communists never really tried awfully hard. They, some of the members wrote about this and tested them about it later. They tried really hard to essentially, you know, jump to the front of the parade. But, you know, they never really 
they never really held open leadership roles in these things. Um, those who became leaders were denying their communists, or they were kind of undercover communists. And the truth, there weren't that many of them. You know, a, a couple of large handfuls, maybe, among the bonus army, for instance. For instance. Um, as soon as somebody in the camp started talking radical talks, they'd beat them up and throw them out. So there just wasn't a whole lot of, whole lot of, of room for these folks. So um, we're going to bring in a question here. Uh, this is from Nancy, um, but it picks up on a similar questions some other guests have asked. Um, but it's she wa Nancy wants to know, was there any public and or political awareness of events taking place in Europe? Was there any impact one way or the other? Yeah, there was a lot of awareness. The stuff was in the papers every day. Um, one of the diaries that I quote from, the woman was particularly interested in, to my benefit, in foreign policy. So she writes about in her diary about the uh, Japanese taking over parts of Manchuria and setting up a puppet government, which was sort of the first steps that led to their to their entry into World War II. Uh, there was talk about uh, Hitler, uh, who wasn't in power yet, but his Nazi party was rising to power. He, he wouldn't take over until early 1933, but his name was in the paper a lot. You know, so all these things that are that are bubbling around were, were you know, they were they were in all the headlines. Any uh, impact on the election? I don't think so. I mean, again, no polling, but nobody was talking about foreign policy at that point, with the exception of like Hearst. Hearst was a, a non-interventionist, and he hated FDR because he thought he was a, a Wilsonite interventionist. Um, he thought Hoover was a bit of an interventionist too. That's how uh, Garner from Texas wound up being the, the running for the Democratic nomination. But that's really as much as again, it's like a, it was a sideshow to, to the bigger show. Yeah. And I, I don't want to. I don't want to get you know too much into what if here, but um, you know, bet a, little, Rose, a little bit never. A little hurts. bit is okay. Um, uh, you know, one of Roosevelt's great rivals is Al Smith, and he should have been sort of the guy, um, and he he kind of fades away. So, is it inevitable that Roosevelt's going to be the man uh, to take the Democratic Party forward? Were there alternatives? Is it a, is it close, or is, is Roosevelt kind of yeah. Gonna gonna be the guy. It was his to lose, um, primarily because of the politics of the era. Uh, New York was the largest state and the most uh, powerful politically. And when you're the governor of New York, you're you're the front runner, no matter what party you're. You're the front runner. Right. Um, and to get the nomination, you needed two thirds of the vote of the, the uh, folks at the convention, the delegates at the convention. So there was a stop. Was that Roosevelt had a majority of the votes going in. <clears throat> he didn't have the two thirds. So there was a stop Roosevelt movement that they that um, uh, Smith and uh, I'm the other guys, John Jacob, um, but they, they want to be the power brokers. Uh, so they thought if they could uh, keep Roosevelt from getting the two thirds, then they would be the person to pick who the, the nominee was going to be. And they kind of thought it was going to be Al Smith or another another go with the, another bite of the apple, but it didn't turn out that way. Well, you know, the, the presidential election is incredibly one-sided, uh, and I think that the uh, electoral vote uh, finally was 472 to 59, which is a pretty much a very one-sided vote, and that Roosevelt won by something like 7 million votes. Um, but uh, was that apparent? Was it apparent earlier in the year? Did Hoover know he was going down to defeat well, can I add to that too? Was anybody saying, "Hey, Herbert, you know the optics don't look good"? <laughs> like, yeah, maybe you should do something different. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, some of his aides were you know, urging him to to do more and get more aggressive, but they were just sort of basing it on um, their personal sense of how politics should be played, um, not on any sort of sort of real data or real analysis of what was going on. Uh, now, Hoover was pretty much dead. I mean, even before they roasted the bonus army, he wasn't going to win an election, um, and after that. There's no coming back from that. You know, he, 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 to the public's eye, the sitting president ordered active duty army folks to rouse former army folks. Yeah. That's, the, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's just not a good thing. There's no way to spin that. So, right. Um, it's not a good look. So a lot of the Republicans feared that uh, he was going to lose, a lot of the top Republicans. They were afraid of what that might do, down ticket to control of, of states and, and you know, the whole usual political shebang. Um, but there was no way for them to come back to him because they had a fatally flawed candidate in a, in a race that he couldn't win. But, I mean, so just again to talk about this a bit, 
you know, you actually talk about how, um, you know, at Hoover, whatever limited campaigning he does, there are people that come out to support him and listen to what he has to say. Right. What would anybody uh, in America in 1932 think was positive about Hoover that would even cause them to, did they support him? Were they fearful of what Roosevelt, I mean, what could they possibly see in him? Well, a lot of folks, um, you know, the, the stats you mentioned, Rick, uh, are significant. Um, but that, you lose, when you look at those numbers, you lose sight of the fact that tens of millions of people voted for Hoover. And, you know, a lot of America shared his economic viewpoint. A lot of them were afraid of Roosevelt. Uh, they were afraid of what his policies might do. There was talk of him being a socialist. Um, corporate America was really concerned about, you know, that how a Roosevelt administration might lead to more interference in their business. They didn't really care about what Hoover's economic policies were. They didn't want Washington to meddle in how the businesses were run. Uh, so there was a lot of support. And when you go to a place like Iowa, which is where Hoover was from, you can get tens of thousands of people to turn out to see it. Um, I would argue that not all of them are going to vote for him. And in fact, one of his aides mentions that. You know, that, you know if he had no illusion that the people who turned out to see the, the sitting president were actually going to vote for him for re-election. It's kind of a spectacle. In, uh, it's something to go see and something to go do. Yeah. Um, after the election, there are four months because they've they haven't yet ratified the amendment that will make uh, inauguration day on January twentieth. So yeah, I love day. that whole gap. So. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, is it going to happen in March? So there's four months, and Hoover, uh, well, he's president, and he wants kind to uh, he wants to try to fix things, but he also kind of wants to rope Roosevelt in and tie him up, you know, somehow with his policies. So he's calling FDR. Uh, to join him in addressing the problems of bank failures and the international debt crisis. And FDR really doesn't want to get involved in this. So, so, so tell us a little bit about that and, and why, why does FDR not want to do anything until, he's, uh, until he becomes president? Well, the, the short answer is FDR campaigned against everything Hoover wanted to do and was doing. And so he wasn't about to sign on to any of these things. Right. Um, it just it undermined his own credibility. Um, the flip side is the stuff that uh, Hoover was asking him to do were things that he couldn't sustain through his own, through his growing view of what the role of federal government should be. Um, one of them was uh, forgiving loans in Europe, which gets into arcane stuff. And Hoover wanted to do sort of a blanket thing. And, and FDR says, no, we do it country by country. So they had a, a you know, split vision of how that should be approached. And there really is no compromise in that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, you know, you're either doing one or the other, you're not doing both. Um, for the banks, I get the sense that Roosevelt didn't want to be attached to Hoover policies lead up to the, the inauguration. Uh, the banking crisis got even worse. And I think FDR's, I know FDR's people were working on plans and ideas for trying to, to stance this thing and fix the, fix the and system. They, and they're literally, I mean, there are calls going on between Hoover and Roosevelt up to the night before. Yeah, into the reality at that point. Yeah, yeah. And I said, now we're going to bed, you know, it's just your ball game until what, noon or whatever it was tomorrow. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Scott, it's, you know, looking back at 1932, and you've obviously spent a lot of time in that year, is, is 1932 a, a pivot point in American history, or is it just another year where a lot of really important stuff happened? It's a good question. I asked myself the question a lot as I was, you know, sort of figuring out how this book was going to go. Um, from a historical perspective, 1933 is probably more pivotal because of the 100 days and the policies that FDR enacted. Um, so that's pivotal in terms of what the government was doing, the political structure was doing. I thought 32 was pivotal, pivotal because that's when the American electorate said, okay, the small government, Republican-led government, Republicans have been in control for most of the previous four decades, I think, um, with the support across the board. Uh, Hoover beat, you mentioned the landslide in 32. Hoover beat Al Smith by a landslide in 28. Right. So this was the year where the, the American electorate said, the old way of doing things isn't working. The country's in a mess. We're in a crisis. I don't know what this new guy in the wheelchair is going to do, but we're going to go for him. And I think yeah. that was what made that such a pivotal year in a watershed year. One of the other issues that you bring up in the book, uh, and it comes up in 1932, uh, you devote a fair amount of time to the Scottsboro Boys, 
Uh, and this is a case where there are young black men in the South accused of rape. It actually happens in March of 1931, uh, but it comes before the Supreme Court in 1932. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this and sort of where the country stood? I mean, the the I think people forget that the, the racial... Um, views of that period, I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of lynchings going on, a lot harsher um, um, sort of relationships over all these issues. Yeah, it was an atrocious time, but I mean, every year back then was an atrocious time if you were black in America. Um, I, the stuff for words you mentioned, uh, young men accused of raping two women on a train. Um, one of the women recanted later. There was a ginned up trial. Uh, the case went before the Supreme Court that figures that intersects in 1932. The Supreme Court held that, um, yes, they had been appointed counsel, but it was an adequate counsel. And, you know, and to meet constitutional obligations, you had to be provided with adequate, adequate counsel. And that sent it back. Um, and that was an important case in the era, not so much in 1932, it transcended that era. But it uh, links in with the Angelo Herndon trial. He was a, a black American a communist uh, who was arrested in, in Georgia and faced a possible death penalty um, for, for his political activities. For handing and, out literature. Handing out literature is what he was doing, yeah. Actually, no, not even handing it out. He was possessing it. He had it in his yeah. mailbox. Yeah, in a mailbox in his apartment. He was going to say he actually handed this stuff out. Um, and I thought that was important because it showed the intersection in that era. One, one of his lawyers was Benjamin Davis Jr., who went to, to become a sitting New York City councilman as a member of the Communist Party. And he shows up in the book I did on the, the 1949 Smith versus USA, the Smith Act case, post war Smith, Smith case acts, Smith Act cases, sorry. Um, I thought it was important to show that, that this was bubbling through American culture at the time. Um, overt racism, violent racism. I mentioned uh, there's a lot of pressure on businesses and small governments, especially in the South, to fire black employees, to hire white employees, because you know, why are we helping black folks when they've got white folks who are starving? And I, I, I think that's been a, a sort of a part of American history that gets overlooked in a lot of books because we tend to focus on, remember I'm a journalist, not a historian. We tend to focus on the big picture histories, you know, the big players were. And when you know a segment of American culture is uh, marginalized politically, economically, socially. They're not going to show up in a lot of those narratives. So I want to find ways to weave this in. And those block legal cases were one way to do it. And using the diary entries from uh, the guy in Fort Wayne, Indiana was, mm. was a good way to get in because it shows, it brings other voices into it. And I also mentioned um, prejudice against Mexican Americans. Uh, there was an active uh, campaign by the Hoover administration to deport Mexicans to Mexico. Whether they Trains were true, going or, to Mexico, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're also deporting American born people of Mexican heritage. So it's just blatant racism. Hmm. And they're just shipping them all out. And yeah, Diego Rivera, the celebrated uh, Mexican artist, was among those who was sort of helping this effort from Detroit, who was doing this, this famous mural in Detroit at the time. And so I wanted to bring all these little cross threads into sort of show. You know, there's a power structure of America that was that was going through its thing. Uh, there were the street protests, the public protests, um, the repeal movement, and then there are your know, Mexican American workers, um, average black folks, you know, going through their lives, going through their lives in the same era, and being buffeted not just by the depression, the economic the depression, but being buffeted by the, the overwhelming social mores of the era. So, uh, so Scott, one of the things I interested and in. I you know I know that you know you were focusing on America but as an American who lives abroad I'm always kind of interested in perceptions of of, of home from someplace else as you're researching the book was did you come across anything about what say anybody else in the world thought about what was happening in America or this decision that they'd made to kind of cast off one version of America and take a chance on another version uh, no I thought okay. about, I, I, and it's a good question. I thought about pursuing that, and then I, looking at you know the arc of what I had in mind for the book, and I couldn't find a place to wedge it in. Okay. And I was thinking about trying to find a way to put it in the newsreel sections, and mm -hmm. I, I just so I just sort of left that aside. Yeah, I just curious because you know, it seems like such, it, it, as you say, it's a kind of a radical departure from what they had been doing, and I didn't yeah. know if anybody at the time said that. Yeah, yeah. 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 the foreign policy implications in Europe, especially, 
that, right. that's a whole different book. You know, it's like it's right, a, whole different, right. book, but a whole different book. So, yeah. I should note um, in those inserts, the newsreels and the diaries, I took that idea from John Dos Passos' USA trilogy. He mm -hmm. used similar devices to kind of achieve the same thing. So, so I didn't create that. I, I borrowed heavily from John Dos Passos. It's a good person to borrow good, from. Good, good source. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, something that you don't really get to until the um, afterward. Uh, but uh, still kind of interesting is the idea that, that uh, and we've touched on it a little bit, that maybe there are some parallels between 1932 and today. And uh, can, you, can you, as we finish up our show here, we just have a minute or two left, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, it's been, it was in the back of my mind as I was writing the book. Uh, so it's interesting to me that the prohibition fight was Northern liberals against Southern and Midwest social conservatives, uh, mostly church affiliated. And we see you know, the same contours today in the abortion fight. So the, these, these poles of American political culture, social political culture, me, are still going at each other, but over different issues in this day and age. Um, there was an urban rural divide. There was that active then and was active now. You know, the sense that uh, farmers in Iowa, uh, their sense is that you know, Washington and, the, and New York and all the liberals over there and the conservatives that are over there don't care about my life as a farmer. All they care about are the Wall Street bankers. And we got the same sense today, still going on. Uh, the left right divide, you know, you, you have conservatives who are complaining about woke culture, um, liberals, uh, socialists, you know, that word gets painted around a lot these days. And the socialists and the left wing are saying the same things about the right wing that were being said back in 1932. So in a lot of ways, you know, these these divisions in American political culture and social culture are playing out generations later without a whole lot of difference other than in tone and, and in aggression, maybe. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess this is... Oh, oh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was going say, this. Um, if you wanted to just... You know, there's a, there's a whole lot in the book, and and you've raised some things that you know we normally don't get a chance to think about. Um, but are there any kind of as a as a wrap up, your last chance here? Are, are there any characters or movements or events that you said I really wish I'd gotten that into the book and I just didn't? Somebody we should know about or an event? Because you're making him criticize his own book at the end of. No, the I'm, 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 I'm giving him a chance to what add. What didn't you get? What's, in there? No, what's the footnote, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you want me to second guess myself? I yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. He wants to create anxiety. God, yeah. actually, not really. Um, and that, that's kind of, well, that's kind of what the neutral gave me. You know, if there were things I wanted to delve into, I could bring them in. Um, I didn't get into Norman Thomas to any great extent, but I got a couple mentions of him in there and the woman yeah. in, uh, in Lake Superior on uh, Isle Royale talks about you maybe we should go for the socialists instead of these two big uh, yeah, yeah. so i mean i probably could have done more on um, socialism as a political force in that era but i just think well it didn't really work out so i guess yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, we thank you. We want to thank you so much, Scott Martell, for joining us today. And Scott is the author of 1932, FDR Hoover and the Dawn of a New America. Uh, it just came out on Tuesday. Check it out. Scott, thank you so much for being on the show thank today. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cheers. Good Cheers. luck. Cheers. Be well. I'm, I'm almost done with mine, so I, 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 I <laughs> well, can't with my virtually. Well, well, <laughs> it's hard work interviewing. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. Oh, wow. Huh. Okay. So, um, Chris, next week, next week, next week, you'll be on the road, right? I will be in, uh, Sunday night. Uh, Sunday night. It must be spa. I'll be in spa. You'll be in spa. I hope there's good, uh, internet in the hotel and spa. I will find out. So if not folks, it's all going to be all Rick all the time in there case, we go. but uh, it should next be okay. week we are going to talk with Andrew Port, who is the author of never again, Germans and genocide after the Holocaust. So yes. in this lighthearted, no. <laughs> Just in yeah. time for the holidays. Yeah, the t topic he has tackled is about how Germany's Nazi past shaped its responses to the genocides in Cambodia, Bosnia, and Rwanda, and further, how those kind of 20th century atrocities, late 20th century atrocities, recast 
Germans' understanding of their own horrific history. And uh, I've, I've started to look at this and looked at an interview he gave, and it's very, very interesting stuff. So I think it'll be a, a fascinating show. And if you leave it to just me, it's probably way above my, my pay grade. I don't think I can handle the whole thing by myself. But, I, you're, but you're damn it, I will You're speaking at a World War II conference in Florida. I am. I'm speaking at a World War II conference in Florida. You mentioned that? You can. I did. You can go back okay. to the beginning of the show and get right. the website. That's January 25th through 28th. All right. So, everybody. thanks to Chris Anderson for recommending <laughs> me because he didn't want to go. I mean, because he couldn't go. He's busy. Um, so, anyway, right. uh, listen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Please everybody. subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout out us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon and browse HistoryHappyHour.com. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Thank <laughs> you.